while you read all about him, you saw his movies probably several times, you know, all the awards that he won. So the sooner we get to talk to our guest tonight, the smarter we will be afterwards. Please welcome our guest tonight, the talented and amazing producer and executive at Marvel Studio, Nate Moore. Hey, how you guys doing? <laughs> Hi, Nate. So, um, as you know, I went to see Wakanda forever again uh, Saturday. Yeah. And I really thought, okay, I'm just going to kind of refresh myself a little bit because I've seen all those movies, you know, that are running for Oscars. And it's, yep. and, um, but no, because the minute the opening sequence of the funeral, I was a goner. Okay. I plugged in and it's like if I've seen it for the first time. It really was all the emotion, all the, uh, you know, the, the stunning beauty, the, the themes, you know, it just grabs you, you know, so kudo, kudo to you, really. Oh, thank you. Um, but um, we want to ask you a lot of questions about it. But first, how did you start in the business? In other words, what kind of train did you take to get right. to Marvel? <laughs> and tell us all the stops. <laughs> yeah, no, I, look, I certainly didn't take the direct route. So I, you know, I went to UCLA for undergrad uh, with the idea that I would get into the film school. Uh, and at UCLA, it's a two-year um, upper division uh, course. And then maybe you get in the master's program. Uh, but the bad news I got was I didn't get into the film school. Uh, so I had to pivot, and I ended up getting an internship at Columbia Pictures. And at the time, this was the late 90s. So uh, I worked in development. I learned a ton about how sort of the development process worked. I worked there for two years as an intern, and they hired me the week I graduated as an assistant, um, which was great. So I what was division? No... What division in Columbia? In in development, yeah. So I worked for a couple of the development executives there under Amy Pascal's group. And it was all about making movies, buying spec scripts, you know, being in dailies, uh, rolling calls, answering phones, picking up laundry, everything an assistant did, I, I did. And it was... And how, how did you get even hired to, to that? Yeah, was it was... It, so I, the internship I got, I actually was connected through a scholarship I had. So the scholarship I had, one of the guys on the board of the scholarship was uh, dating a girl, or sorry, was roommates with the girl whose boyfriend was an executive. And that's how I got an interview. And it just happened that we headed off in the interview and he hired me again, free as a as an intern sure. and then later as an assistant. Uh, and I ended up working there for two and a half years. That's sort of how I learned about development, about producing. Um, in the late nineties things, scripts were selling three for a night. So it was- Hello, I was an executive at this. Yeah, it was a different time. Different <laughs> times, I say. Um, but after two, after about two and a half years, I got tired of sitting behind a desk. You know, I was 24 years old um, and I, I needed to be out. So I, I put everything I had in storage. I backpacked around the world for six months. I spent every penny that I saved. Um, and when I came back, I needed a job. And my old boss, who was uh, still an executive at Columbia Pictures, got me a job as an office and set PA on Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2. And that was the other half of my film school. So if being an assistant was about development and producing, this was about actually making movies. Uh, and, and for me, not being a film student, it's what's a grip? What's an electrician? How, what's a visual effects supervisor do? What's an onset painter? Like being around the people who actually made the movies. And I thought that was really interesting and actually was more in line with how I grew up. I was sort of had a very blue collar upbringing and, and being on a movie set is a little bit different than being in an office. And so I really dug it. I really did. Um, and I was on that movie and one of the PAs on that movie became an AD on a small independent film called The Dying Gall which was the opposite experience. So at the time, Spider-Man 2 was one of the most expensive movies that was being made. Right. The Dying Gall was a 16-day, all-location, low-budget movie uh, with a first-time filmmaker starring Campbell Scott and Peter Sarsgaard and uh, um, Patricia Clarkson. And I was the key set PA. 
and and I learned again just more about how sets ran, like uh, how important it was to have relationships with your talent, what a DP do, do, did, because in that case, the filmmaker had never done a film, so he really relied on the DP to place camera. Yeah. Um, uh, and 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 it was a valuable experience, but all movies end, and I needed a job again. And I ended up in the Sony Pictures temp pool because I used to hire from there when I was an assistant. And I got a call from a former executive. His name is Peter Schlesel. He used to be the head of Sony. Of course. And Peter was helping a, a gentleman named Jeff Skoll build a company. Sure, participant. That's right. So Jeff Skoll and his partner, Chris Adams, uh, who neither of them were film people interviewed me in the office they were sharing with Peter and they hired me in the room because they didn't know any better to be quite honest and I started as a as a junior executive um, and I knew the business I knew how the you know the agencies ran and management companies I knew all that so I I could talk a good game but I hadn't done it before um, <laughs> I was the second employee for part, what would become participant and I got to help build that company for five years uh, with Jeff and Chris Alvatera, who was there, and then Jonathan King in development and production. We yeah, had, yes, we had uh, financing for development, which was great. We could co-finance movies. The only thing we couldn't do was distribute them. So we were always looking for partners. And again, this was at a different time in the business where the, a lot of what would be called mini majors were really interested in the kinds of movies that Participant made. So Participant was all about films that were about social issues. And we would partner with Focus and Paramount Vantage and um, uh, and and a lot of the studios that are now labels are no longer there. Really, Searchlight's the only one that kind of made it through that crucible. Yeah. Um, but, By the way, we we had uh, Kevin Nealon here, sure. and we asked him uh, how he knew Adam Sandler, and he said, "We both are from the 1900 meeting from the 1900s." <laughs> No, but it, it, it truly was a different time. <laughs> um, and so I did that for about five years. And then it was it became harder and harder to get our movies out, to be quite honest. Um, and so I started looking for an and to be quite honest, I also was interested in other kinds of movies. I love all kinds of movies. I loved right. certainly independent films. And I love movies that are about things. I love action movies. I love aliens, right. you know. Um, and so I got a job at a, at a foreign sales driven company called Exclusive Media, which was run by Nigel Sinclair and Guy East and Simon. Sure. Um, and again, I learned a ton. I didn't love the model, but foreign sales is a way you could make movies. Sure. And to work with the sales team and go to film markets and figure out how you package movies so that you can raise enough money for the budget and, and make it and, and hopefully, you know, get your return in the domestic box office was really interesting. It's not a model I like. It's not a model I would return to, but it was it was good for me to know how that worked. And at the time, it worked for a lot yeah. of people. Yeah, and and I was there for a, about a couple of years, and I started looking again because I wanted something that felt more stable. And a friend of mine who is an agent, uh, and agents tend to know most things, if not everything, said, <laughs> "Look, I hear Marvel is hiring, but it's a really small company, and no one really knows how they work." And I happened to know an executive there because he went to undergrad with my friend at Northwestern. So I cold called him and I said, hey, I hear you're looking for an executive. He said, yeah, I, uh, you like comics, right? And I said, I did because I do. And I sent him my resume. And for some reason, he felt compelled to put my resume on Kevin Feige's desk. And Kevin looked at my credits and, and saw exclusive media. He didn't know what that was. He saw <laughs> media. He didn't know what that was. <laughs> called the dying gall didn't know what that was but then saw pa on spider-man 2 and said hey i wonder if i'll recognize that guy and that's how i got the meeting because i was a pa on spider-man 2 about 10 years earlier um, so was kevin involved with spider-man 2 yeah so at the time he was working for avi arad uh... yeah and so he would be around you know he'd be around he wouldn't be you know right next to sam but he was the guy next right. to the guy next to sam and so uh, we met in Manhattan Beach and hit it off at the Starbucks across the street from the from the <laughs> studio. And he hired me and it's been almost 13 years. Wow. Yeah. Who else did they have at the time um, working there in development? You know, now it's such a big sprawling business, but at the yeah. time. It, it's ironically a lot of the same people. So really? um, uh, my colleague, Stephen Broussard has been there from the beginning. His first movie for Marvel was was the uh, Louis Leterrier Incredible Hulk. And he was at the time I was hired in 
pre-production on Captain America 1. Um, my colleague Jonathan Schwartz, who has gone on to do Shang-Chi and Captain Marvel and the Guardians franchise, was Kevin's assistant. Um, my colleague Brad Winderbaum, who did uh, Thor Ragnarok, Thor Love and Thunder, and Ant-Man, uh, was Lou's assistant. Uh, it's sort of a lot of the same people. You know, Jeremy Latcham, who is the executive who I called, is no longer here, but he produced the new Dungeons and Dragons movie that comes out next year uh, and, and only left a couple of years ago. It's a place that has hung on to the core uh, for, for the bulk of the life of the company. Well, it speaks volume really about management too, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, um, so you were into comics? Yes. You were? Yeah, so I grew up reading comics. I was the youngest of four kids. We grew up in a small town with a single mom. So you you figured out how to entertain yourself. Uh, and my brother is eight years older than me. So I got his hand-me-down comic books uh, and hand-me-down books and watched a ton of movies. Uh, and that was sort of how I spent, especially the summer. So I grew up in a town called Clovis, which is in central California, right. uh, which is a great place to grow up. But the summers are incredibly hot. So you want to stay inside. So we'd stay inside and watch movies, we'd stay inside and read, stay inside and play games. Uh, we'd go to theaters and theater hop and go see three movies for the price of one. Like we sort of made the most of it. Yeah, um, that's that's sort of where my love of comics and, and film came from, to be quite honest. So the Black Panther. Um, how did you even know about it? I'm asking naive question because I've never sure. read basically yeah. a comic book, but. <laughs> When I grew up, where I grew up, we read Kafka. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and yeah. So the question is, how did you even know about it? And why did you think that the time has come for it? Yeah, Maybe. I read it. You know, I knew the character from comic books. So he, especially back in the day, a lot of times was either a, a special guest star in the Captain America books or he was on the Avengers. Oh, um, and so he's been around for four decades, you know, um, and when I came to Marvel, one of the three things Kevin wanted me to start on was uh, Doctor Strange, Iron Fist and Black Panther. So it was already a character that was in Kevin's mind, too. It just took us some years to figure out how to crack the story. Um, and and we'd started development on it with a, a very talented writer named Mark Bailey. We kind of never really had traction. There was always other things that were sort of more important for the company a, as a whole. Um, but it's a character that I always thought was interesting. And so when there became an opportunity to introduce him in Captain America Civil War, um, I pitched it to Kevin. He was interested in it. And so we we talked to the Russo brothers. And Joe Russo is also a comic book guy and right. knew the character and knew what it could mean. Uh, and so we jumped all over it. And um, was the world <clears throat> was the world in the comic as beautiful and uh, as as in the movie, no. I mean, it was, different. was, it was there some kind of beauty? There was, but it was a much uh, a much less culturally specific beauty. So in the comics, uh, Wakanda is very much a technological paradise. It is a little bit more in the vein of a Jack Kirby kind of, um, they had something called the techno jungle, for instance, which looked like, looked like a jungle with just circuits and, and interesting detail but was not anchored in the specificity of sort of the African continent. Uh, and that really didn't, it came in two stages, I would say. One, when we cast John Connie to play T'Chaka, T'Challa's father in Civil War, sure. John is a native Kosa speaker. Um, and Kosa is one of the languages in South Africa uh, that is spoken prevalently. And, and Chadwick heard that sound and said, that, that should be the sound of, of Wakanda. And he learned Kosa, for that movie uh, and, and we'd end up using that as the basis for the sound of Wakanda. The visual language of Wakanda was built by Hannah Beekler, our production designer. So Amazing. she was uh, under Ryan's direction was really interested in taking the best of the continent from a visual standpoint. So there are touchstones uh, from North Africa, there are touchstones from Central Africa, from South Africa, um, from the coastal uh, countries. And she sort of, you know, narratively, what we talked about was the idea that Wakanda, to some degree, was the cradle of civilization in Africa. So the diaspora, we got to use all that because it all kind of originated from this place that had never been conquered. And that was important from a, certainly from a narrative context, but from a design standpoint, the notion that sort of more traditionally Western uh, 
architectural elements didn't find their way to Wakanda because they were never conquered by another, uh, sure. another country. Yeah, no, it was stunning. And the costume. Yeah. Yeah, that's them. So um, did you have already a script for the sequel for, you know, Wakanda mm -hmm. Forever? And then when Chasma, Chasma, <laughs> Chadwick, I told you I'll stir problems. Chadwick passed. Did you then have to pivot? Was there already a script? Yeah, so we did have a script. Um, we did have a script written. We were in pre-production. Um, wow. Um, and so we had the we had the you know the pre-production crew on. Um, and and then, you know, when Chad passed, we had to figure out sort of what to do. And we had a lot of conversation internally of of should we even make the movie? to be quite honest. Um, as you can kind of tell in just my retelling, Chad was a big reason why T'Challa was who he was in the MCU. You know, from, from the way he moved to the to the dialect, um, Chadwick was at the ground floor of all of that stuff. So it at no point did it ever make sense to recast him. That wasn't a conversation we ever entertained. It was just sort of like, should we should we just not make the movie at all? Um, and it was- what, was- what was the script? I'm just curious what it was about. It was it was not dissimilar from a narrative standpoint, meaning it was very much about Namor and Talo Khan and the um, the friction between the two nations because of how vibranium had been discovered in the oceans. I see. From an emotional standpoint, it was about T'Challa learning he had a son and becoming a father and having to almost be the T'Chaka to the T'Challa in the first movie. How do I train the sun to to move through the world in a way that is honorable when right now I find that my nation is at war? Um, and so from an emotional standpoint, the movie was completely different. From a general shape and feel, it was not dissimilar. Um, and, and when we decided that we could move forward um, with the movie and talk to Chadwick's family about how they felt about it, you know, we had to figure out how to take the things that were working, but also um, address the elephant in the room. I mean, we lost a friend and we lost our main character. I have to tell you, the elephant in the room, there was so much emotion in Wakanda mm -hmm. and meditation about grief and healing. And it was, and it felt authentic, by the way. It didn't feel like, you know, an organic. It didn't feel like it was manipulative anyway. And I think that's why the audience plugged into it it was almost like Shakespearean it was like kind of like a catharsis for people who were really impacted by Chad you know it was amazing yeah I, you know, yeah I, Ryan ahead. as a as a storyteller Ryan is always interested in anchoring whatever the movie is and what he's going through as a person and so the first movie is very much about Ryan grappling with being an African-American man divorced from Africa. Uh, and the second movie, as I mentioned, was gonna be about fathers and sons because he had just had a daughter. So he was he had just become a father himself. So that was something thematically he, he understood how to explore. Yeah. And then we lost Chadwick. Again, he figured out how to turn what he was experiencing, the loss of a friend who, who had affected his life in ways he didn't understand as much until he was gone and really exploring what that loss meant and, and what are the stages of grief. So, it, so when you say it's organic, I, I think it's because it was something that was from what Ryan was experiencing and not something that was imposed on the movie that he was, yeah. you know, he wrote it with Joe Robert, Robert Cole who also lost Chad. So there was a shared uh, a grief that we were all processing honestly, and it sort of made its way into the movie. I know. And, and, it was felt. It was really deeply felt in the movie. Okay, I'm going to open it up for the student because it's really for them. Uh, Mike, do we have questions? We do. Uh, we have a question here from Thomas McNeedy. Thomas, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Nate? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, hey, Nate. Yeah. Uh, just one question, I guess. Uh, what is your favorite movie of all time? Favorite uh, film? That's a good question, and uh, maybe it's surprising, maybe it's not. My favorite movie is The Goonies. So The Goonies is a movie I saw as a kid uh, in the theaters, and it was maybe the first time where I felt like I wanted to be in the movie because the mm -hmm. adventure felt so um, immersive, and I really 
believed it, even though clearly it's not a something that really happened. Um, and it was the first time that I wanted to go back into the theater and watch it again. And it, it is a movie that I can turn on at any point uh, um, that I find funny, I find interesting, I find emotional. Um, it, it, it is nostalgic, certainly for me. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a movie that I that I that I just love unabashedly. Wow! All right, thank you. Sure. We have another question here. This one is from Haley Meyer. Haley, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Nate? Hi, can you guys hear me? Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I was just wondering, with doing both like smaller independent films and big budget films, do you have favorite parts of each? or maybe less favorite things that you could leave out that you could like mishmash together to make your ultimate movie making experience? That's a great question. I mean, I, I think, I think when you are working on a bigger budget, some ideas that seem unachievable are achievable and that's fun. So you, you kind of have a little bit more freedom of thought, but I will say generally I find the process pretty more similar than you would think. You always run out of money really fast. <laughs> um, you always at some point look at your budget and go how are we going to do this you always need more days you always want more um and it really to me to me development is the most fun part of the process because you don't have to say no yet right everything is everything is blue sky everything works uh, hopefully on the page you get excited about a lot of things and then the practical side uh of the producing uh process kicks in and you have to figure out how, what you can actually achieve and how do you retain the spirit of the thing you loved from the script onto the screen and through into post? Um, but I love all of it. I mean, part of what makes filmmaking fun is, is that it is collective storytelling. And it's really about the people you surround yourself with, again, from beginning to end. And so in that way, again, the, the actual mechanics of what you're doing is not as different as you might think it is. Certainly there's more gear on a big movie and you probably have the crane for your entirety of your shoot, but otherwise it's it's very similar. Awesome, thank you so much. Sure. We have a question here from Alice Louise de Filippa. Alice, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Nate? Hi, Nate, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I wanted to ask you, what would be your best advice for someone who would like to start a career in the business side of the movie industry? And when you say business side, do you mean specifically producing or legal or business affairs? Or what are you thinking? Uh, I'm thinking both business strategy and also uh, producing, but more uh, in development rather than line producing or you know further on the, produ the production process. I think they're probably two different paths, to be honest. I would say for creative producing, um, especially initially, there are, there, are, there are sort of two paths that are achievable, I would argue. One is going through an agency. Um, and starting in the mailroom and becoming an agent's assistant and then either transitioning to being hired on as a, a producer's assistant or an executive assistant, just so you start to learn the lay of Hollywood as it functions as a as a entity, because it is a little bit of a learning curve. Um, if you're talking about business strategy, I mean, you could you could intern and or uh, uh, assist a lawyer or a business affairs executive. Those jobs tend to be less coveted, but there's probably less of them. So um, it's an interesting, it would be, a, it would almost be a different set of, of contacts you'd want to start making. Um, certainly business affairs, and even to some degree, physical, um, uh, um, physical production executives would be a good gateway to that. And most studios have, I mean, all studios have business affairs execs and physical, uh, physical production execs that you could probably try to become an assistant to. But creative producing is a little bit of a different muscle and a different dynamic, to be honest. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Well, we have a question here from Fiorella Lima. Fiorella, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Nate? Hi, Nate. It's really nice to meet you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, what would you consider to be the biggest struggle in your career and how did you overcome it? That's interesting. Um, 
I mean, as my story says, I got lucky a lot. I mean, I think the biggest struggle, to be honest, um, is there's not a lot of opportunities for anyone. Um, and 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 I think I know that it is easy to become discouraged and want to stop because you're not seeing the forward momentum you want. And a lot of times we, the Royal, we put pressure on ourselves to advance faster than we're going to. I remember, for instance, uh, when I left Columbia Pictures when I was an assistant and I told my boss I was leaving and I was like, man, I just really don't want this to hurt my career. And she says, what are you talking about? You don't have a career yet. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, oh, I don't. Um, and at every step as a junior executive, you want to be the producer and you're not. Uh, and you want to be in charge and you're not. And you And it takes a minute to get there. And, at, and there are going to be a lot of times where you go, man, I could be doing something else and probably be advancing more quickly. Um, and so you really got to love the path. You know, um, I had friends who went into finance who were certainly more financially successful than I was faster. And you kind of look around and go like, I'm pretty smart. Why is this not happening? And the truth is a lot of it is chance. And a lot of it is, is sort of... Um, figuring out the things you don't know and building such a knowledge base that your talents and tastes are undeniable. And, and when I say that, one of the hardest things I, I think people struggle with is the amount of work you have to do outside of your job to actually be good at your job. I read a ton of scripts that I don't need to read just so I know who's out there. So if, if I need a writer, I know where to go. I know what the trends are. I watch a ton of movies. These are not things that I get paid to do technically, but it's all stuff that makes me better. And even when I was an assistant or junior executive, I was reading stuff I didn't need to read and spending time on the weekends where my friends were having fun and doing things you want to do when you're in your 20s or early 30s. But I liked what I was doing enough that that, that preparation didn't feel, it felt like a sacrifice, but it was one I willingly did. And it paid off because when I met with Kevin and he said, who are great writers? And I could name a bunch of them and they were real. I wasn't and I wasn't saying Scott Frank, I was saying like writers that we could hire. He knew that I had done the work. And so you have to kind of do the work behind the scenes to get to where you want. So all that's to say, it's going to be really easy to stop and say, I can't do it or I'm not progressing fast enough. You have to want it enough and like the process of getting there enough that you can't be anywhere else. So true. Thank you for that. Um, we have another question here. This one is from Dwight Bradford. Um, so Dwight asks, would you recommend crowdfunding to finance an indie film? Ooh, it depends on what your budget is, I guess. Um, how much money do you need the crowd to fund? Um, I, I think any, look, any way you can do it, try. When you are starting, there's not a wrong way to do something. Um, if you are trying to raise $2 million, that might be a challenge. But if you're, if you're saying I need $50,000 to shoot something, I think it would be great. Do it. Um, the, the, the downside to crowdfunding is if, if you feel like you have to, like, it should almost, it's almost a charitable donation, meaning you're, they're probably not going to get a return on their investment and they probably should know that going in. But if it, if it allows you to get the tools, you need to do something that is going to be a calling card. Yeah. There's, there's not a wrong way. I mean, don't steal, but there's not a wrong way to try to find <laughs> a movie initially. You're just trying to get out there. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here from An Dao. Um, An, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Nate? Oh, hello. Um, actually, I'm having two questions. I'm not sure I'm, I'm greedy, <laughs> but uh, I really want to know like, what inspired you to be the producer of these you know, very big hit like Black Panther, Eternals, and uh, you know, like uh, Captain America, like Civil War and the uh, Winter Soldier. Like another another question is, um, can you tell tell us like what are the hardest challenges when you work with the actors, you know, screenwriters and um, directors? Uh, that is that's like twelve questions, uh, <laughs> just because of the complexity, not because you <laughs> asked twelve things. Um, no, like I'm I'm inspired by movies. I love going to movies. I love walking in a movie theater. I like watching previews. I like it when it's dark. I, like I love it. So, uh, and I feel lucky every day that I get to work at a company that makes it. Um, so it's not one thing. I think the process of making movies is hard. Um, and frustrating and rewarding and exhausting. Um, 
but as long as I remember how much I love watching movies, that's inspiration. That's the inspiration I need. Um, the size of the movie, again, doesn't matter. I was ex as excited to try and help make the visitor as I was for Captain America Winter Soldier because it's an experience, right? And and yes, the budgets are different, but if the, the experience should feel similar. You should feel emotionally touched and moved and maybe have your perspective challenged a little bit by anything you do. Um, the challenges of dealing with creative people, I'll, I'll say that. Uh, boy, there's a lot of them. Uh, creative <laughs> people are creative for a reason. They, you know, actors and actresses have a process they need to go through and that process is sometimes on their own time and can be frustrating and you want them to do things faster and quicker and with less drama and that doesn't always happen. Um, writers and directors, uh, again, directors, I would say, when they're good, want everything, and you have to figure out how to give them what you can and still get the best out of them. But their job is to push you, especially as a producer. I think the job of a director is to ask for the moon um, because they're trying to make the movie as good as possible. And they probably at that point legitimately think the moon is going to help. Your job is to figure out how to give them the thing closest to the moon that you can achieve that still gets their vision across the finish line. Writers are interesting because. Um, and somebody said this, and, it, and it's sort of right, it's sort of not like, I think we all think we can be writers. So sometimes you're asking writers to do things because you think you're right. And do you think they should just do exactly what you say? And really what you're asking them to do is, is do exactly what you want emotionally in a way that they know how to deliver. Um, so, um, but I would say all three I have found over time, and it's something I had to learn, really, even though you may not think it or it may not seem like it, really respond well to direct honesty and that I didn't say criticism I said direct honesty because a lot of times I think people have the founded or not notion that you can't be honest or that you have to say yes and then figure out how to say no other ways I think you can say no as long as you're being thoughtful about it and are having the conversation and I and I have found that they appreciate the honesty of that because it allows them to go, oh, you're you're straight up with me about this. So that means you're always going to be straight up with me. When you start to not be honest with people, then they start to not trust you generally. And then I think you lose being a part of the creative process in a real way because they just can't trust you. And the last thing they need as creative people is to not know where they stand, I find. I agree 100% from experience. Yeah. It's a tough one. Because it's hard to say no. You have to find the way. Yeah, yeah, and you, and you, it, you know, and and I think you have to. My 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 old my my first boss, Shannon Golding, said at first. She said, "You're working for the movie. You're not working for the director. You're not working for the actor. You're not working for the writer. You're working for the movie. And as long as you're honestly doing that, even if they don't like you for a day or a week, if it's for the best for the movie, you have to figure out how to get it done." Um, and it's not, I certainly have no illusions that I am friends with everyone I work with, but I hope they'd go, hey, Nate's working for the movie. Yeah. Oh, we do have a question here. This one is from Jada Stevenson. So um, Jada's asking, uh, how do you recommend finding jobs in the film industry if you're new to the industry with little to no connections? Yeah, it's hard. Uh, the, I wish I could tell you I had the great uh, uh, backdoor. Uh, I don't know that it exists. I, I, I generally think if you don't know anyone, you have to, the agencies are the best route. It's not a route I took. It's not a route I think is always pleasant for people, but they have a high turnover. So there's always a lot of openings and it is a very good way to meet a lot of people very quickly. So if you're in the, any, mail, any mailroom, pick your mailroom. Uh, and work your way onto a desk, any desk, uh, you're going to have a better shot at getting your next job because there's so much opportunity there in a way that there's not at studios. Like studio assistant jobs especially are hard to get because the turnover is low because they tend to be a little bit more stable and they tend to pay a little better. Um, whereas agency jobs, unfortunately, don't pay a, a great amount of uh, 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 a great amount and they require a ton of time. So there's a ton of turnover. So that to me, when people say, I don't know anyone, I go, look, you may have to spend a year or two at an agency figuring it out. Ultimately, I think it can be a really valuable year or two because you'll find yourself 
a, a, around a lot of smart people like yourself and build a class. And then you'll all, all of a sudden you'll find yourself with a peer group who then can be helpful, but you need to get that peer group first. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question here from Emmett Rogers. Emmett, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Nate? Hi, Nate. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. My question um, was specifically in your role for Wakanda Forever, what was the time commitment like on set? Basically, I'm curious to uh, know how often were you on set while they were making that one? Yeah, so we're at a, I think, a pretty privileged position at Marvel in that we tend to work at on one thing at a time. So I was on set every day. Uh, and I, my rule is get there at call and leave at wrap so that the, so that the crew feels like I'm with them because I am. Um, so yeah, every, every day for every day we shot that very very long movie um so when i'm on a movie i tend to move my now entire family with me to wherever i'm going because it is uh, both a commitment in production but also pre-production so for instance on wakanda forever i was in atlanta for just about a calendar year wow. um, between production pre-production production we ended in puerto rico but yeah every day um you're you're busy every day you're troubleshooting every day um, and and I try as much as I can be to be a partner with the filmmakers so they know they have, again, an extra set of eyes and ears, looking at the monitor, pitching ideas, always trying to make it better. Our job is to try to make it better um, uh, in any way possible. Awesome, thank you. We have a question here from Christopher Cook. Christopher, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Nate? Hi there. Hi, Nate. Thank you again for uh, giving us uh, your time out of your busy schedule to answer our questions. Sure. Uh, my question is, as a developing producer slash director, how do I attract the attention of studio executives and producers like yourself to new projects that you're developing? Well, the, the quickest way, if you're a director, well, I would say, again, a uh, uh, more complicated question, maybe it seems on the face. It, it's a, it's a, um, it is a material driven uh, business ultimately. So mm -hmm. I think the quickest way is if you have a piece of material that's great um, and it's something that that has perceived, I'll say perceived value to a studio, that's gonna be helpful, right? Because uh, value can mean a lot of things and a lot of times people don't see the value in things that are incredibly valuable. Um, but it is having a piece of material that, that is sellable that a studio uh, would want to buy, even if they don't buy it, just the fact that they're reading it and meeting you is how you start a relationship. Uh, and if that's not the one, hopefully it's the next one, but it starts really with material more than, I mean, I guess who you know is important to, to a degree, but that that's probably a one-off situation. If you know somebody who knows an executive, you could probably get a meeting, but if you're talking about really anchoring yourself into the business, it's material. It's what is that idea or pitch or script or outline script is best, obviously, or a short film that you'd finance with crowdsourcing, whatever it is, material is king. Fantastic, thank you. I just have one other quick question. Uh, what skills would you recommend for a developing producer to achieve the level of success that you have? Oh boy, well, um, I think everybody approaches the job of producer differently. Um, for me, uh, I like to think I'm pretty good at identifying talent on the page and expressing myself both verbally and uh, on the page. A lot of my job is is talking to people about what I think works and doesn't work and or writing that down in notes, hopefully that are helpful. The other part of my job I think that is interesting and that I like to do is, is what I call being a good improv partner like figuring out what a movie is and, and figuring out how to make it better, not because it's my idea, but because it's their idea that I understand and wanna amplify. Um, and sometimes I think um, you can get hung up on, it's not the thing you want it to be when it, and when it kind of can be the thing it needs to be, yeah, it, it might not be exactly what you thought it was, but it can be pretty great. Um, but being able to see the forest from the trees there and going, oh, I want to change it just for ego's sake, or I want to change it because I really love the Goonies is not a reason to change something. Sometimes I'm I'm not going to get the Goonies. Uh, I might get something that's great uh, if I can figure out what is great about the pieces I'm being presented, you know. Um, and I think 
to build on that. One of the one of the um, things I think is not helpful as a producer or an executive is only pointing out what's not working. Uh, that's fine. I think it's important. I think you have to a point out what works so people feel good, and b if it's not working, how would you fix it? I always go, how would you fix it? You can say this doesn't work. That's fine. We can all say it doesn't work. How do you fix it? Because it's in the how you fix it that you're a value add. Otherwise, I get a really good script reader and I save a bunch of money. So it's 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 and and being a partner when it, being a partner is also taking on the problem as your own and not saying you got a problem with that script. It's like we have a problem, but I have solutions. Come, let's get in the boat. Like let's row together. Um, so that your writer and director and cast, if you're down that road, feel like, man, he's working with us. He's not working um, for us or at cross purposes. He wants it to be good in the way that we all want it to be good. Fantastic. Thank you, Nate. We have a, a question submitted here by Casey Boyack. Casey, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Nate? Hi. Um, thank you for doing this. Sure. Uh, what advice do you have for uh, aspiring film majors, particularly aspiring screenwriting majors? Uh, write. <laughs> Never stop writing and say goodbye to your friends. Uh, all my friends who are working writers, I did not see for like five years because <laughs> they went home and, and wrote, you know, and, and, and don't get hung up on the one great story you have. I think it's great to have the one great story, but you need a lot of stories. Um, and I think sometimes people stop and really polish that script and that's great. You need more than one. And any agent manager executive is gonna be like, this is awesome, what else do you have? And if you don't already have other ideas that you love um, and that you can creatively stand behind, you're gonna get in trouble, so right. Um, uh, a lot of my friends who are writers also started as assistants and they would write at nights and on weekends and we, and we wouldn't see them. Um, because so much of writing, as everyone knows, is is rewriting and not just like in the throw it off rewriting, like really getting in there and figuring out, oh man, is this the right movie? Like pull it apart, break it down to parts, figure out if this is even the movie you want to tell. What's thematically, why are you interested? Why would you want to look at this for another four years? Like you have to love it. Uh, if you don't love it, I'm not going to love it. I'll tell you that much. So it's, as much time as you can commit to writing, write. Thank you so much. Sure. We have a question here from Anastasia Malgui. Anastasia, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Nate? Thank you so much for being able. Oh God, I'm so happy. I'm so excited. All the way from Nigeria. Hi. Hi. Um, my question, yeah, my question is good like this. Um, the whole directing thing, how is how what's what scripts would you consider to be like um um how do i put it now god i'm so anxious <laughs> what script would you consider to be you know able to be produced you know like top notch for production oh i mean it, um wow it's really um i would say this you you if yes. you're talking about what script as a filmmaker you, that you should try to produce, it's one that speaks yes. to you personally, one that you understand at the core level emotionally what the movie is about, um, and something that that you're gonna want to spend the better part of two plus years making it. I mean, if you're lucky enough to find mm -hmm. finance, you know what I mean? Uh, because yes. so much of this process is about the director really understanding the nuance of every single character and beat in the movie and loving it. Um, and if they don't love it, figuring out how to how to change it in the way that retain, again, retains the heart of the movie, but is still uh, something they understand. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's easy to be attracted to, to scripts that feel or sound commercial on the page. And it's like, there's a big idea or it's world building. And I, and I think that sometimes is a mistake because as someone who evaluates uh, directors as well, just because I have to hire them, I'm really looking for, is their film emotional? Um, mm -hmm. More than I'm looking for, hey, did they get to do a bunch of visual effects and build a fantasy world? That's that's fine and it's helpful, um, but but I didn't hire Chloe Zhao because she'd done it before. I hired her because the writer was really emotional. 
and I didn't hire Ryan Coogler because he'd done it before I hired him because Fruitvale Station is incredibly emotional. Um, and figuring out that's the stuff I can't, I can, I can kind of teach you to do visual effects to some degree because I've been around it for so long. Um, and I know what good stunts are and I know all that stuff. I, like getting a performance out of an actor is, I don't know how to do. So I want filmmakers who do know how to do that because that's, I can support them with everything else. So as a f director, to answer your question, what's emotional to you about the movie? Do you know how to get the performances out of those characters? Um, and are you going to believe in it enough to, to put everything else aside and make that your priority for, again, as long as you, you need to get done? Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Uh, we have a question here from Katie Ko. Katie, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Nate? Um, thank you so much for being here. First of all, like as a film student myself, I think this is a really cool like getting insight. Um, my question was, have you ever had the obstacle where what was written on the script or like the original idea didn't translate as expected onto the screen? And if this has happened, how do you overcome this obstacle? Yeah, uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, it depends on your resources, right? Like um, we're able, we have the resources to fix things if they're not working. Um, by the time you get into post and you watch the cut and you go, man, that really didn't work. Um, I will say the things that end up not working, we kind of always know don't work. Meaning if you have a weak spot in your script, it's not going to go away. It's not going to solve itself. You're not going to shoot it and it's again, not going to be there. All the problems you have in development are your problems that you have in post. So it's always cheaper to try and fix them on the way in. And sometimes time doesn't allow you to do that. And sometimes extenuating circumstances don't allow you to do that but you know the beats in your movie that don't work or don't work as well as you want them to those are the problems those are the problems in editorial um how you get around them is um having great editors who are willing to throw the script away and go okay i know you thought the movie was this but it's actually this other thing and having the bravery to 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 really pull up the railroad tracks and rebuild it into something else and see if it works and that's scary and that's time. But sometimes you have to go, I know this was a script, but that's not the movie anymore. Because in post, all of the it could it could be if if we were lucky, conversations go away. And now you go, this is what it is. So if if these are the ingredients I have to make this pasta, let me let me try eight different ways to make the pasta and not just get stuck on, well, the script says it's this, so this is the order. We mess with structure all the time. You know, you can pull performances out of stuff that's past cut or before you say rolling. Uh, you find moments everywhere, but you have to really look for it and you have to be willing to take some swings that feel really uncomfortable. There's been certainly been times in post where somebody suggests something and I go, but that's not what the movie is. Um, but that doesn't mean that's not what the movie could be. You just have to be willing to take the swing. Um, so it's having a little bit of courage in editorial to go, man, I know this was supposed to work. It doesn't work. Now, guess what? I'm taking that storyline out. The beginning's now the end. Uh, here we go. Thank you so much. I wish you the best of luck on all of your future projects and movies. You too. We have a question here from Kiana Barbieri. Kiana, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Nate? Hi, um, you had mentioned being scared of damaging your career when leaving your first job at uh, Columbia and your boss sure. making a joke, you know, saying <laughs> career. Yeah. Um, but what do you think is the best indicator to know that you need to move on in order to climb up the industry and rather sticking to that job security you have now? Yeah, I think it's, um, that's a great question. There's no right or wrong answer, really. I think it's a feeling. If you feel like, man, Either they don't appreciate me, which is a conversation you can have. And, I, and I, uh, you know, I'm careful to say that because I know appreciate is different now than it was 20 years ago. But like, really like, hey, I'm, I, I've stopped learning and they, they're not interested in me learning more. You can start thinking about moving on. Um, I always say it is easier to find a job if you have a job. So I, I'm not the advocate who says, hey, just quit and good luck. I'm, it's like, start looking, but keep your job until you find that other job, because it's so much easier as someone who hires people, knowing that someone else is employing you, to be quite honest. Um, um, and I would say, you know, sometimes if you believe in the people, but the, but the work isn't, com isn't coming, 
it's okay to stick it out. Like sometimes you're going to have lean times at a company where, man, we haven't made a movie in two, three years and I'm frustrated. I'm going to go find a place that's making movies. But if you believe in the people you're working with and for, stick it out because it just takes one movie to, for that to turn around pretty quick. Um, and it is, I think, hard sometimes to find people you want to work with who share your creative sensibility. So sometimes it's, it's okay to stay. Uh, even if you feel like, man, we haven't made a movie. Because um, that's the thing I think that catches people up the most. I haven't made a movie. I got to go where they're making movies. That's good. You certainly should do that. Um, but there's something to be said for working for people who, again, you believe in. And and it, it, it really takes one or two things to break your way before you're at the place everybody wants to go. And you're like, man, why, why would I have left this place? Now we're, we're killing it. Um, so if you believe in, in the people you're with, stick with them. Thank you. We have a question here from Joe Smith. Joe, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Nate? Yes, uh, my question is um, for an indie producer who is not from the Hollywood system, uh, but aspires to produce a studio film, what are some of the things that uh, said producer would need to brush up on or uh, what skill set would he need to or what knowledge base would he need to do to prepare himself for that next level of producing? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is going to sound like not helpful. You need to produce movies. You know, if if you're saying, hey, I want to get into the Hollywood system and produce movies for them, you need mm -hmm. to produce movies outside the system. So they go, oh, he can do it. Cool. Come do this movie. Because um, the proof ultimately is in the pudding. I, I don't know that I've ever heard of an someone from outside the system being given a studio movie without them having two or three or four credits that 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 are great you know the other way you get in there is you find a piece of material a studio wants and you and you're attached as producer they're probably going to pair you with another producer that that has been through it mm -hmm. um, um but but yeah the the biggest skill set is is having produced films um because producing a movie is hard and it is going to suck up all your life. Uh, and if you're lucky, you're going to, it's going to be worth it. Um, but it is time consuming. It is constant troubleshooting and problem solving. It's both financial and creative. And, and you can say you're ready to do it, but until you do it, you don't know. So I would say, go try and produce an, a small movie and then you start your work your way up and then, and then you'll become somebody they, they, they're going to call you hopefully, you know, um, but yeah, I think you got to start just producing. Yeah. So Thanks. Nate, I am so thrilled that you came. And I also want to say that I can see why you are so successful. First of all, your advice is so on point. It's just crazy. Second, no, really. And the second thing is that um, I asked you if you would like, you know, that we would like you to come and you said yes, and it got done. Okay. It, it's just, I see that in many, many successful people, right. it's just, they go, they say, I'll do it and they do it and that's it. And they move on. And this thing got done and now on to the next thing instead of postponing and come, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So that shows great character. Um, so I just wanted to um, thank you so much, really, for coming here, spending time. You're always shooting something. Hey, by the way, what's next? Uh, Captain America 4 and Blade were sort of back to back. It's going to be mm. busy. busy next year. Great. I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> Somebody's Siri is listening. That's that's good. <laughs> okay, Siri, but uh, <laughs> there's a lot to learn. Yeah, I didn't understand either. <laughs> so I don't know in which end this is, but anyway, it's really funny. Um, so. Um, and any surprises in this new? Oh, not state? not that I want to give away. You get. Gotta... <laughs> oh, I was hoping you would be off guard. <laughs> Kevin came, and he 
gave up so much. <laughs> like, it went viral. <laughs> just nobody went viral. Not Spielberg, no Pacino, Kevin Feige went viral all over the world. But I want to tell you something. I think that the message, the most important message of Wakanda really is how to overcome the need and the want for revenge and instead finding peaceful solutions. Sure. And I think it's the message of our time. We yeah. need that kind of message. Yeah. And I think that the Marvel Universe is probably the ultimate messenger in right. that way. And so I wanted to say thank you. Thank you to Marvel and please continue the good work because we need it. Uh, thank you so much for your kind words. And thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Thank you very much. Namaste.